today's episode, we are going to dive into the storyline a little bit more on Melissa's marriage. She has interjected over the last few episodes, little bits and pieces of what was going on in her house. But today we are going to back up and really take a deep dive into what was going on in her house from the point where she boarded herself up in her home up until we are current with our timeline in 2015. Faith can feel like hearts and butterflies until someone lights a match and burns it all to the ground. Welcome to the Burning Butterflies podcast. The sad thing is, is that there's abuse of every kind within the church. Um, but the spiritual abuse is the stuff that just well, will... a place there shouldn't be abuse. Like, there just shouldn't be abuse in a place that claims Jesus. Well, in a, it just... It ruins your soul. If you're new here, we suggest listening to our prologue episode first. This is the story of two women's journey through spiritual abuse and escaping from toxic church culture while finding hope in Christ. Sometimes it's just the facts, and if you get offended by it, that's that's a you issue. Um, and if, if we can't be mature enough have these conversations, even if some of the topics are difficult, then shame on us. So I had mentioned that a few months into my marriage, I had boarded up my house in reaction to the reality of the nightmare that I had just unleashed, so to speak. Um, and you know, when I say that I told my therapist that I felt like I had fallen into a pit and spent nine years trying to claw my way out, that that is like no joke, but I really want to come from this from like a few different angles, because to me, the way that we have decided, um, to tell the story of this podcast from a timeline perspective, it really has revealed all of these like different strands within our story and each of the strands within itself is like a dynamic story, but they all weave together and they create like this fabric of the bigger story. And so I want to do justice to the individual strands. And I also want to weave them together in a way that helps to create that fabric of the bigger story. And so the strands that I want to focus on in this episode that relate to my story are like, the me factor. So like my personal journey, um, of like my identity and what was going on with me. And then also what was going on in my marriage. And then also I want to bring in like my relationship with the church. So ministry, my relationship in my ministry work, um, which is really once you're into church, like that's just your whole identity becomes that. Yep. What's your ministry, right? We're Mm -hmm. all on it. First ministries in your home. and <laughs> Well, and look at any meeting we were involved in. It was, you know, we're going to go around and we're going to talk about what ministries you're involved in. Like that yes. was almost how you introduced yourself. Yeah. I feel like it was, how did you, there was like a, a set series of questions. Like, so how did you come to come as you are? Yeah. And then, oh, how were you involved? Yep. Yes. Yeah. That was like the piggyback of questions. And especially like if you were there for a while, it would be more focused on how you evolved. Yeah. So in the story of me, I really feel like it's important to start out and mention that before I met Froggy, that I had multiple friend groups that I would socialize with. I had different people that I would go out on adventures with. I was participating in community theater. I was running 5Ks and mud runs. I was very active and I was always on the go. But As far as like the context of like my marriage story, the way that my brain dealt with the abuse and the trauma was to form what I call, and like, this isn't scientific or anything. It's just how I describe it. Um, I have these like memory clusters. And so rather than holding on to and remembering every little detail of every experience, I have these like mile marker pivotal moments that not only for me break up the sequence of the abuse, but they also act as like reference guides to what was going on at the time 
in between like the mile markers. And like, if I'm honest with you, I think this was my brain's way of protecting me from how like the depth and the extreme hurt and pain and abuse that was going on. So, but I say that just to say, like, I don't like my time frame. Some of them are just like generalizations of like, I knew this was happening in this time and I don't have necessarily all of like specific details, but I'll do my best um, because some of it is just like, it's so grouped together. I just have to be like, well, I know this is what was going on and these were the things, but I still want to do it justice. But I just asked for a little understanding and you might be like, why, do, why can't I have all these details? You just don't get them. <laughs> um, as far as ministry goes, um, there was something you said, Amanda, in our last episode about mom's group, where you were talking about how you needed mom's group because it was your saving grace. Mm-hmm. And also it was the thing that was killing you at the same time, essentially. Yeah. And I realized that that is why I want to talk about this strand of the story about my relationship with the church and with ministry is because that is exactly what was going on. On one hand, it was what was sustaining me, what was filling me, what was keeping me with my head above water. But on the other hand, it was also the poison that was slowly killing me. And so, you know, I really want to talk more about that later and dive kind of into that dynamic, but um, that's some background on the three things that I really want to bring into this. And so, um, because it becomes almost like an addiction and it's, it's the thing that's, that's harming you, but yet you need it in order to, you feel like you need it in order to survive. And I think that that is something that is common for people in any toxic situation, whether it's at church or in a marriage or at a job or anything, you get this, like Brandy talked about in our last episode, a dopamine rush. You get that. That's what I was going to say. You get that dopamine and you just, it, it feeds that and you just feel like you need to keep going. Yes. Well, and especially with ADHD, other things that it feels good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all right. So I've done my homework because I want to make sure that, that I can stay clear and that I could stay like on point and not wander off and squirrel out on some of this. And like, ultimately my goal in telling this story is to bring awareness to the domestic abuse and violence that happens, especially within Christian relationships. I know I said I wanted to start like at the moment, like when I like right after where I ended the last podcast with boarding at my house. But there's actually a couple key points that happened before that that are really just going to set the stage. So I kind of want to start with those. Um, And so just reminding our listener, you know, we got married in February of 2012. And by March of 2012, so we're not even a month in. Um, I had posted on Facebook, I made a post about, I want to have an Alice in Wonderland life where I will no longer be yelling these things. Like I am going to whisper the things I want to yell. And this is a post that I posted on Facebook. And that is something that like, I mean, I didn't realize was 30 days, like within 30 days of getting married, there was so much yelling. Um, and I wish that I could say like, I had a great patience for being yelled at. I I did not back then. Like I legit, if you yelled at me though, you know, the more you raised your voice and the more combative you got, I was going to match you and defend myself like in, in that way. And so, but within 30 days, I had gotten to a point where I was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to, I'm not going down this road again. I've just dealt with, I'm coming out of dealing with my own anger issues. I was on a, you know, a good path. And I mentioned, you know, like I was living my best life, but I've also mentioned in past episodes that I was a total mess and I had a ton of unresolved trauma and I was in nowhere in a mental 
healthy state at that time. But I didn't know that. That's a 20, looking back 2020 vision. I didn't know that. So um, that tactic of where I did, I literally would start whispering in conversations where it is the second that he would yell, I would just lower my voice. Um, I think that started me. I still do that today in a sense. Like, I think I learned about how to regulate for other people. That was like the first moment that I realized that was a thing. I wish I could say that that was an effective tactic in my marriage. Um, it later became weaponized against me of like, you think the things that you say are okay because you whisper them. But the things you say are worse than the things I yell at you. Okay, well, the things I'm saying are truth. And apparently that hurt you more than what you think you're yelling. Like the level of the justification of his behavior wasn't hurting me as much as my whispering truth at him was hurting him. And so then... <clears throat> The also problem with that <laughs> tactic for me is that it became his goal to make me yell. So if he could push and push and push and push until I would become the bad guy. Were other people in your guys' life saying that you whispering whatever was also a problem or did anyone know like recognize that? no I don't think there was any interjection of like this specific technique from other people you know like this was just my personal and this is what I would do and I'm getting a lot of the outside stuff from you know his family is just more of like yes we told you he had anger issues <laughs> like these are his anger issues <laughs> and so well, and that's that's kind of where I was going is it's accepted, right? It's accepted yeah. that he's a yeller, right? Yeah. And this is where I was told um, at some point before I boarded up my house, uh, which happened, you know, before July, um, I was told that I needed, if I was going to be married into this family, this is what Charlotte told me. If I was going to be married into this family, I needed to have a thicker skin. And I was like, Lady, <laughs> let me explain something. <laughs> my dad was a yeller. I think I was yelled at every day of my life. Um, so it's probably not exactly like, but that's how I felt as a kid. I just felt like I was yelled at for every little thing all the time. And so yelling at me is not an effective, it doesn't, doesn't go well with me. Um, I also was in the military and I had a drill sergeant in the military whose goal was to make every girl cry. And he could not make me cry. And when he confronted me about it, I said, I've been yelled at every day of my life. You got to do better than my dad. Like, but he got nothing. You got nothing on my dad. Like, so you can stand here in my face and yell at me. I don't know you. I've already and been that's... calloused from that. Like, you're, you're, yeah. you're yelling at a stone wall, right? <laughs> and that's something that I think as our listeners, if you're just, you're like, okay, like, they, they yell like, you know, some houses are just louder and some houses yell and some families yell. Um, the excuse that was used at come as you are was like, well, Tom is Italian and he's just loud and he's, you know, passionate and he's, he's passionate, passionate and he's, you know, about. he's zealous for the Lord and all of these things. But until you are on the receiving end of that, it's not just someone talking loudly to you right no and the things it, that are being yelled i mean we're talking about like name calling puts down shutting you down like they, these are undermining things in a relationship deep and i rooted undermining belittling soul crushing things being yeah. and i just want to you. point out that the justification of those things wasn't supposed to hurt my feelings as much as I would whisper. Like, and, and I'm going to give you, I'd be like, that hurt my feelings when you said that. And that was abusive to Froggy. What I just said that I was abusing him. I didn't yell. I find it funny because I'm Italian. I am loud and I communicate through yelling. 
And even today, I still have a very hard time not screaming at people to get my point across. And that was held against me from day one. And that's why we would, Tom and I would go round and round because I would yell back at him because I didn't know, like, I mean, this is what we do. And so I was told the opposite. Yeah. That I shouldn't be yelling. Why am I yelling at everyone? Why am I screaming in the sanctuary? Why, 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 why? And so I just find it very funny, the double standard. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, like, the dynamic is, like, absolutely insane. And then for me personally during this time, uh, because, like I said, I boarded up my house before July. Um in June of 2012, so we're now a few months in, my Facebook feed turns into like phone games. So all of a sudden, like, it's like all this Farmville stuff, right? I hate phone games. I absolutely hate them. I don't watch TV. And that might not sound like such a big deal, but for me, like, I'm an active person on the go, right? And I met this man who portrayed himself as somebody who wants to be on adventure and go with me. And, you know, within 30 days, we've got this Jekyll and Hyde thing going on. And then, you know, come to find out that he don't want to do anything. Like all he wants to do is sit and watch TV or play games on his phone. And I'm being forced to participate in that. Like there is no what I want to do. Like, this is the start of who I am and the things that I like to do becoming a problem. Um, and so, like, I love to go hiking. I want to go and do these things. No, we can't do that. And and he just wants to sit on the couch and do nothing. But I also have to participate in that. So I'm now being bullied into I have to sit next to you continually or I deal with the incessive questions of like, where are you? When are you going to be back? Um, so there was never like a, okay. So, cause I'm thinking a couple months ago, you text me yeah. and you were like, Hey, I'm going hiking this weekend. Do you want to come with me? Right. And I was, and I, my response to you was like, I would love to spend time with you, but I'm going to be honest. Like nothing about me wants to go hiking. Like, right. And so it was that, like, I want to spend time with you as my friend, but realistically, I know I would not enjoy our time together if I was doing something, you know, like that. Right. right. And so it was this, like, I love that for you. You go hiking and then we'll find something to do together as friends where we right. both can enjoy our time. There yeah. was nothing <laughs> like that of like, honey, you go do you. You go hike your beautiful self up the mountain. And when you come back down, we'll do something fun together. No. So like, we've already like, understand that the layer of I've already established that within five months, I've boarded up my house, that the things that were going on, that the behavior that was night and day from meeting, you know, Mr. Wonderful to now his behavior, this abuse cycle was so bad. I boarded up my house. Um, so I've already established that. So there's already this, well, what are we going to do? Well, I'm doing this. Do you question that? Like you, you begin this process of there's this tension and you're going to start walking on eggshells and you're just waiting for the next incident, but you're trying to avoid it, you know, because now you don't want to poke the bear. And this is so a very we stubborn man who's like, no, I'm not going, but you can't go either. When you boarded yourself up in the house, was that used against you? Was that like a a thing that was thrown back in your face of, well, you're just going to go crazy again? Yeah. I mean, like, I, I will say, I don't think that, I think I had enough incidences after that that were used. There were definitely things that were used more prevalently, but the story of Melissa's crazy never went away. Um. And that, that one leaked out, Brandy, that one leaked out into, you know, the narrative of the church people 
um, because I was the lady that went crazy and boarded herself up in their house. And so I that, that was that one. For yeah, I only heard briefly about that, but I do think it's funny that it was part of the church culture that we all had to do what the men wanted to do. Yeah. And part of that is because the men were told you're the leader, you're the greatest thing. So we had to submit in all ways and do what they wanted. That was very much the culture. Oh yeah. Well, and I think that it perpetuates, like this is church culture perpetuating an abuse cycle because yes. like you said, Brandy, you know, I think Froggy, you know, is very similar in that way of like, there's this tension because I'm trying to come back into that middle ground. Like I'm on the extreme of being large and in charge. And so I'm supposed to come back and get a little bit of this meek and mild that I'm trying to be good because on one hand, you know, some of these things are being told to you that you're wrong and you have this man comparison. So there's this tension, but we can only behave for so long. Then there's an incident, right? And then we have this reconciliation phase. And then there's like the calm before the storm and the things that were going on, like the name calling, the put downs, the being shut, shut out, the crazy making cycle, the things getting broken. This phase before I boarded myself in my house, this is like, this is like abuse light. <laughs> so you said, you just said something, the crazy cycle. Yeah. That's from love and respect. Yeah. And that is being thrown out there also. And that's important to remember is that we're constantly getting this, you're married. Um, and you don't want to go down the crazy making cycle. Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to jump in the crazy cycle. And so if there's something that's causing you to do that, it's one, because that's what that book teaches. And so when you have that, and in your case, it's constantly, you're the one there's never self-reflection of, no. am I the one who's causing our marriage to turn into this crazy cycle? Like, no, you're the one. It can't be yeah. me. It has to be you. Yeah. 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 I, I, absolutely. And, um, so also at this time, like, um, so as far as like ministry goes, this is when like destiny's child was like new to the church. And at this point I had become friends with them. I was in the sound booth, but ultimately my goal was to be a singer. Like that has always been like my life's goal is to be Taylor Swift. Right. And then when we get to July, and this is why I say like I had boarded myself up before July, we get to this family signing contract, which we had talked about in a previous episode. And I just want to reiterate, like to put you in my mental space, I thought that that contract was going to be a miracle. Like the cycle had ended. This is the end of the first cycle of uh, the abuse cycle in my marriage. And we now have this reconciliation, which I want to point out was done in the form of a big display. Like honestly, in my gut, I don't know this for a fact, but I truly believe in my gut that that whole men's propaganda, that whole signing the creed was all done because of my marriage. And there might be other people out there who think that it was, but I think it was done to help Froggy get back on track because everybody and thought that by Froggy marrying me, that, that I was going to be the miracle to fix Froggy. And when that didn't happen within the first five months, we had to have this signing a big contract of being a man of God in front of everybody display. That's going to be the miracle that gets Froggy on track. And that is so on brand for come as you are. And for Tom as a leader in general is everything is going to fix it. I mean, like, good Lord. Like how many times did we say like, this is going to be it. This is finally, they're going to see, this is going to fix it. It's going to be, this is going to be so much better because you're, you're living in this constant chaos, but that's also very on brand for Tom of like, I don't want to deal with it because when it comes down to it, People and their problems are annoying to him. I firmly believe with my whole chest that 
he became a pastor because he wanted to be in charge. He felt like I need to do what God wants me to do, but I have to be the one in charge of it. Who's in charge of the, of the things of God, the pastor. And yeah. I think that's why he had to start his own church. Oh, but I, I fully believe that's why he doesn't have a mentor and why, if you ask yeah. him, he'll, he gets mad at you and he can, he'll defend himself yeah. to kingdom come that Jesus is my mentor. Arrive. Yeah. Yeah. Paul didn't have a mentor. Like, you know, I have the Holy spirit. (laughs) Um, but no, but I don't think I don't want to deal. Yeah. He doesn't want to deal with stuff. He doesn't want to deal with people's problems. He didn't want to deal with the fact that, Oh crap. My son said he was going to do it right. This woman he married said they were going to do it right. And now it's so terrible. She's boarded herself up in her house. Like what, I can't deal with this. I can't go down this road again because we've established Froggy. He has an abusive track record with pr- other previous relationships. And so I don't want to go down this road again. This was supposed to fix it. Um, great. This movie came out. Let's just, we're going to do this. Yeah. Full on. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. And I thought that, I mean, like, this is how convinced I was that that document was the miracle that was going to um fix my marriage is that it took years for me to have the guts to tear that document up and i did it as an act of like you lied and this doesn't mean anything and like to me i was tearing up the bible like honestly i felt like i was tearing up the bible and you know, that magnitude and he laughed in my face. That doesn't mean anything is what he said to me years later, but this started the next cycle. And, and so now we're back in this, we've had our reconciliation phase. It's been supported by the church, you know, and this Mm -hmm. is where the things that that culture, the church does where they, They strongly advise women to forgive, to remain in the marriage and to pray. And he is a man of God. And so we can't spoil his image. Um, And, and men believe they're right. Like they believe they're being convinced that they're right. And that their behaviors to torture their wives and to be abusive is they, they feel justified. And so that just like perpetuates if I said we were at level one in the first five months, we're, we're creeping up levels in, in what's going to start happening in my home. But, um, so I am personally, um, becoming better friends with destiny's child. And, you know, I'm, I'm still a personal trainer on the side and, um, I'm in my need to be a stay at home mom phase, right? I can have my little personal training job on the side, but we're really trying to start implementing, you know, he signed the contract. He's the man. He agrees to be a man of this creed that he signed. And I'm also expected to become this 1950s housewife, right? Um, And so, when you hang out with like musicians who are like in a band and they do things, you know, that's what you guys do for fun. And so destiny's child, um, the lead singer, she really, she's like, wow, you know, Melissa, you can sing. Um, and she wants to help me with some vocal techniques to help me improve my singing. Right. She's like, I love like your range. And which has always been a struggle for me because I have a very low voice. Um, and uh, that's not typically where, you know, you really want your female soloist to be is, <laughs> is like singing way down here. But so anyway, she's like starts working with me on like some vocal techniques and we're moving right along. So still not leading worship, but definitely, you know, in with the in crowd. Um, now, Froggy had... um started working for a family that went to come as you are. And he worked in their, their store in their business when we first got married. Cause like I'd said before in previous episodes, he had to get a job before we got married. So he was working there. Um, and 
that work environment for him uh, put us in a lot of that tension cycle uh, for abuse. Uh, the person that he worked for, I don't know. It's like, for Froggy, it's like a vicious cycle because he'll tell you, like, I'm not qualified to do anything. I'm the victim. I can't do anything. And then turn around and be like, I should be a manager. I'm so cool. And then be mad that nobody is allowing him to be a manager, but none of his actions are acting like a manager. You know, like he really acted like a spoiled child and he had like a warehouse job, but he felt like he needed to be a salesman. Like it's oh, like, Oh, you I'm mean like his, he watched his dad be qualified for nothing and not go to seminary, but then start his own church and be in charge of everything. Yeah. And, and throw fits if he's not in charge. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You mean and Generation so X white entitled men in America? <laughs> What? <laughs> Just go watch the TikTok and you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so for Froggy, there's this work tension, you know, and the guy that he, what I was saying is, is the man that he was working for. He's also a very dominant alpha male, right? But he's doing it. And so, you know, he's got the, I own my own business. I'm successful. I'm the owner and he's a very dominating uh, personality, you know, like Pastor Tom, a very dominating, I'm large and I'm in charge. And Froggy just wants to be large and in charge, but he's like the lowest man on the totem pole. And so there's a lot of tension there. And then there's also, as far as like, uh, like ministry stuff for Froggy. There's also a lot of tension there. And so he is just this time bomb of, you never know what's going to set him off. And something that I've, I've noticed talking to women is like, you learn and maybe you two have experienced this, like, you know, it's going to make your husband mad. And, you know, or, you know, when he's mad, like, you might feel like you have to walk on eggshells, but you know the things to not say. You know the things to not do. You're like, I can give you a little space so things don't blow up or whatever. Um, with Froggy, you never knew what it was going to be, ever. Like one day, something might make him mad, and the next day, that thing won't make him mad at all. And there was never any, even any consistency to the things you were walking on eggshells Four. And so it was like hit or miss. Um, and so he goes to work and he's doing his job. But like I said, he's got that struggle of that tension of I want to be great, but I also don't put in the effort well, to do it's so. The, it's He's been promised these things. Yeah. You know, like, and that's part of the Christian Christian issue too with nostalgia and the good old days and you know he's supposed to be able to have a wife 2.5 kids buy a house have a car a boat go on vacation once a year be middle management yeah so none of those things are attainable anymore and so because and you're doing what, it right you should be hashtag blessed by this point right yeah i and showed I up Got the job. He showed up. Too, is because he's so angry with the way his life is, and he feels out of control. So, because I am like this, and Froggy and I are alike in some ways. And when it's you're mad at your situation, and so you're mad at the world, and you lash out, and it's a different mad every day. Right. Yeah. And and at this point too, like, um. Oh, goodness. So I didn't think about this strand, like the backstory of Froggy coming in as part of the story. But like, so I talked about he brought, you know, a joint on our, our honeymoon. So at this point, like he is self-medicating himself. So we are now like completely, like constantly high because he's so extreme to one end, but not getting help. And he's not getting help because... One, we've talked about how mental health is frowned upon as you are. 
Two, he in the past did try to get help and some of the medications that they put him on caused even more problems drastically. And I can't even say that those medications were the problem, but also he has drug use in his past, like extreme drug use. And so when you're doing extreme drugs because you're self-medicating and you're taking prescription drugs, those two, that combination is very volatile. And so he has a lot of past um, experience with that not going well. And so he has found that he prefers to just smoke weed and be high and then everything's fine. But the problem is, is that he doesn't know when to stop. Like there is no, this is a person who is very unstable in their mental health, who does not have impulse control, um, doesn't know when to stop in regards to anything. And so would smoke weed and smoke weed and smoke weed and smoke weed until he didn't have it, then be very mad and angry. And this is another tension builder that would lead to, to incidents. So he's angry that he can't get high anymore. But even though he smoked like the entire field, like in the last four hours, it's like, what are you doing? And so this is really tension time. So this is a lot of eggshell walking. Um, and so you've got the work tensions, you've got, uh, needing to be the provider and, uh, you know, you're, you're the man of the house and you've got your stay at home mom, wife now with 1950s. And so this time is just very, very tension building. And then you've got like the ministry pressures, like I said, like froggy thinks he's supposed to be the next pastor, Tom, but there's nothing that he's doing to walk that walk in any way, shape or form. And in fact, he's like borderline doing all the things that he's not supposed to be doing while trying to put on airs and present himself as somebody who's doing it. Did Tom ever verbally be like, if you could just get your life together, you could, you could take over for me. Like, did he ever yeah. say those yeah. things? I won't say like those exact words, but it's but like something yeah. that was dangled you know, of like, he's being told he's supposed to be because even out of his own mouth, you know, and nobody's arguing, nobody's telling him no, because the so conversation. It's like a, yeah. It's like a toddler. If you are good in the store, you can get a candy bar. Yep. Yep. If exactly. you behave, to you control. This, control. Yeah. yeah. If you could just get over this, you know, you could take over the world. You know, I mean, that was always, always the parenting strategy from them. Um, and so an example of this would be like, and it's so funny that you bring up how, oh my gosh, like this is like just a reality check of how you brought up how Tom has his church. Like he couldn't play nice in the sandbox at the Baptist church. And so the only way that he can be number one in charge is to have his own church and God tell him that this is how it's supposed to go and then create an environment where nobody can argue with you. Uh, but really not. And we have... always hate when our kids act like us. Right. I mean, <laughs> no, but like, so we went to a bonfire with the youth group and now we're in like November of, this is the end of 2012. So we're coming on like a year of being married. This is November of 2012 and our family, you know, we got kids in youth. But like going along and saying that like Froggy goes to church every Sunday with his family and we all put on the, he's the man of God, don't spoil his image, everything's fine, this is what we're doing. He sits in the foyer of the church. He never goes into service and sits in the service unless his his mama, you know, makes him. Like if she can get a hold of him and be like, come sit with me, you'll either see him sitting with his mom or he's outside of the sanctuary sitting in the foyer and usually talking with some of the other gentlemen that are also sitting out in the foyer. So there's this like bonfire in the youth group and we, we are participating because we have kids in youth and we're going to this bonfire and understand that Froggy truly believes that he is spiritually gifted in teaching and he's supposed to be like in charge of something and leading something, if not the whole church, which later on he does end up teaching in youth group. 
And to me, if you're somebody who realizes you're gifted in a certain thing and you're trying to do things right, wouldn't you actively want to participate in things and be drawn to them and, and engage in them? We go to this bonfire and the entire time when he reached his limit, which was I'm here because the kids had gone like early and we had shown up later. So we show up. And like his little ticker is like, we're here for 10 minutes. We got to go. And so we're sitting there and the entire time that this whole event is going on, like the kids are at the bonfire, they're doing marshmallows. Everybody's having a good time. I'm trying to enjoy the good time and the socialization and talking to people and, and all of this, like a bonfire, like you would go to a summer activity event. And this is, we're sitting there and the whole time he is quietly being like, we need to go. Is it time to go? Are we done yet? Are you done yet? Can we go now? Like, this is dumb. Like, I just, we, I gotta go. We gotta go. Can we go? Can we go? And I'm like, from somebody who's like spiritually gifted to teach and ends up teaching youth and is supposed to be a pastor and you want nothing to do with this entire event. You came, you saw, get the kids, let's go. And was miserable and made the whole event like miserable. And that's not the first event that he made miserable. But how how are you spiritually gifted? At, explain that one to me. <laughs> but Who does Tom that would sound do, like, Amanda? I was going to say, but Tom would do the exact same thing when he would show up to VBS or the giveaway or anything. The only time I never saw him show up to a big event and not be that way was the big summer park event but he got to stand on stage and be in the worship team the entire time and have a microphone in his hand. Yeah. And because he was on stage, people didn't interact with him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and nothing disqualifies, you know, Tom from being a pastor, but he's yep. got a list of things that will disqualify you from your ministry and everything that you do, <laughs> the, the absolute insanity. And so we've been in the tension phase, which means the incident phase has arrived. And by this time, Froggy has had his blow up. This time it wasn't an at home blow up. It was an at work blow up. And so the job that Froggy got when we first got married, because you have to have a job and be the sole supporter of your little family that you got going on. He has a huge blow up and he gets fired. And so, <laughs> but it's the people, they work at church or the yeah. people he works for go to church. Yes. They go to as you are. Mm -hmm. How, how did that go for them and Tom? Well, okay. Oh my goodness. Here's another dynamic. So this family, they have a heart for people who have struggles because they have their own struggles, you know, which a lot of church people do where they're battling their own demons. And so we can help you battle your demons. Um, but it's almost like you would think that that would cause a big issue, but it really didn't like, it didn't stop their participation, it was almost like, well, this is who Froggy is and sorry, right? And we move on like everything else. We just, whoops, and move on. So it was more like Tom and Charlotte just ignored that it happened rather than like yeah. dealing with it. I mean, like this wasn't like, okay. yeah, there's no dealing with it. Like we should help our son or, you know, or... Like, we should be like, hey, let's, like, really talk to you about this. And you were wrong. It's, no, we perpetuate, oh, you were wronged. There's no accountability. You're not responsible. Oh, poor you. Oh, you got fired. Poor you. But what are you going to do now? Like, you know, there's more focus on you have to have a job than ever fixing the issue that caused you to get fired in the first place. And so by December, I kid you not. So, I mean, we're talking at some point before December, he loses it, gets himself fired from this job with these people. And he goes back to work at another job that he had had previously to me meeting him. Okay. Another company that he had worked for went through an abuse cycle with them, lost his job, got fired, goes back and they want to help him. Yeah, man, I help you. I got to get you a job, right? 
Nice. So he's working for a friend of his. And this is a little better because now Froggy could be a little bit more himself. In a sense, he doesn't have the church pressure at the job also. Um, but he gets, I mean, I think he was there for like two or three weeks. And so, and this is the beginning of December of 2012. And he's at work and they're driving to a job site and their truck gets sideswiped and Froggy breaks his neck and not like snapped his neck, like breaks his neck. I have never of, heard this. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the like butterfly wings in your neck on your, your spine, the wing broke. So it's not like he broke into the nerve you know, like clavicle or whatever those bones are. I don't even know in your neck, whatever those bones are called. I'm not a doctor. Um, the wing, he broke the wing. And so he is in this neck brace, shoulder contraption, has his arm. He, he cannot move his arms, his shoulders, or his neck for like six weeks. So you have a man who is like OCD control freak because he, he has no control within himself. Right. So he's like overly controlling. I've already, I think I, hopefully I've already painted that picture and now cannot do anything for himself. And you know, the sick part is, is that this moment in time for me, as years would go on, became a time of reference where I was like, we can go back to that. I could deal with your insanity when you can't do anything about it. And so like, I would be like, all right, guy, could you just like paralyze him? You know? So he's just like a head on a body in a wheelchair. I can listen to his mouth. Yeah. If he can't physically get up and do anything about it. Right. Like I'll just lock him in a room. Like these were fantasies that I've had and everybody and anybody who's never been abused is like condemning me right now, but every woman who has suffered the hand of abuse from their spouse is like, yep. So it is what it is. I mean, you really do fantasize about like, how am I going to get out of this? And sometimes that fantasy leads to, you know, this moment really gave me that window of like, I was like, yeah, the man could just be paralyzed. That'd be great. I'll deal with you that way. Um, and so that was a lot of tension. Like we're in a new cycle. We've had a, we've, we've, we're in a new cycle of abuse. It's a, this is a lot of tension. Um, oh, and then we get to Christmas Eve and my son tears a tendon in his knee on Christmas Eve. So I now have a husband in a neck brace who can't, is not mobile from the shoulders, like the sternum up. He's like not mobile cause he's in a brace. And I now have a teenage son who has just busted his knee and needs knee surgery. So this was fun. But um, also that took the attention away from Froggy. And so that was, that became a big issue. So this is a very miserable time in my house. Um, and we're at Christmas time. But on Facebook, I have posted how amazing and wonderful my husband is because he got me the one thing I wanted for Christmas and that was a French press. That's what I got for Christmas that year. And I kid you not, within three months, that French press, he threw against a wall and broke it. And I think he was still in a neck brace, not the halo, when he broke the French press that he gave me at Christmas time because he threw it against a wall. Um, so yay, but on Facebook, my husband is so amazing. Anyone that makes those kind of posts, I just want you to know, we all know you're lying. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And like, it's so dumb. Just so, so dumb. Um, and so, um, that job, I think he kept until like May of 2013. Um, and ended up getting fired for smoking weed. So because his usage had gotten so out of control and out of hand, it was now affecting, um, you know, his job of like, you're a professional going into somebody's house and you're just a pothead. Right. So 
I think the biggest narrative from Froggy is like, I didn't do anything wrong. Um, and I'm also now like checked out a lot. My Facebook post is becoming more and more of these, like, like I am playing literally like the, this Farmville game as an escape and to keep the peace in my home. And I'm completely miserable at home. Um, the gym I was working at gets sold to somebody else. So I now really have no job. And so I'm trying to find work, trying to do something. Uh, Froggy's on disability. He gets his job back at the store with the people from the church. Of so course he ding, does. Ding. This is round three. Ding, ding, round three. This is the third time that he has worked for this family because he cannot get a job anywhere else. Well, you can't pass a drug test, so you can't get it. That eliminates a huge, at this time, that eliminates a huge population of jobs. Uh, and, and this this family, like you said, does have a heart to help people, and they're just as ingrained in this toxic church environment as the rest of us are at this point. And so I'm sure they have this pressure of, well, we have to help him. He's, he's church family. He's family. Yeah. Well, and Jason was sent there too to work at one yeah. point. Oh, and I didn't know that. Um, oh, it did not no. work out. Tom, Tom would <laughs> offer... <laughs> Tom would offer jobs to people that he had no right offering jobs to people. He offered houses to people he had no, like, uh, Jason the, and the, the audacity got into it immediately. Yeah, oh, the audacity yeah, could, that yeah. Tom had overstepping was off the charts. No, that is absolutely. I mean, it is, and honestly, like. This is one of those moments where if you, people are like, you were not in a cult. I'm like, are you kidding me? When the pastor of the church is organizing jobs and where you're going to live and your friends and how you live your life and how you have relationships with your children and, and who when watches your children that much say in your life and how it is being uh, designed, that is a cult. I'm sorry. But you need to take a step back, Pastor Tom. That's a cult. And that's not okay. And that is how Froggy got his job. Because, of course, his dad went to bat for him. So, like, during this time, for me personally and, like, my ministry, um, so because I was in with Destiny's Child and I was working on, you know, being a vocalist, um, I actually got to be, like, a backup singer. Yay! Um, and so I was singing on stage. Um, and so, you know, I'm like making leaps forward towards my ultimate goal. And there is some sort of narrative propaganda that gets put out that if you are going to sing on stage, like there's like a, this isn't performance. You have to be humble. Like you should be willing to do any ministry. Like this isn't like a pedestal, right? And this is being told church wide, like mm -hmm. from the stage in sermons, in every ministry group, we're going through this narrative. So I, I know it wasn't like aimed at me necessarily, because it'd be really crazy if this was only about me. Um, but there had to have been other things that I'm not aware of that were going on that people were either complaining about the people on stage. Um, this may have been a little bit of people the older generation that wasn't happy with like the destiny child type of worship. Where it was. You, and there, yeah. we had to do our time. Yeah. Yeah. I was a part of some of those complaints, like in Bible studies and stuff. And so some of it was the older people did not like the more contemporary feel that destiny's child was bringing into the church, but also you had the younger generation who was really drawn to it, who were excited about Destiny's Child. And Destiny's Child, while they are very sweet, kind, humble women, they weren't self-deprecating. And Tom didn't like that because it was taking attention and it was 
like they're not actively telling people, oh, don't look at us. Like we're nothing. Like they were just constantly pointing people to God and, but they weren't like verbalizing that. Like, it's not me, it's God. They weren't, they weren't playing the church vernacular game that the rest of us knew that we had to play. And Tom didn't like that. Yeah. Because they definitely were a performance group, but I would say in their hearts, they were like, like you said, behind the scenes, if you talk to them, like they always point everybody to God, but you know, when they're on stage and they're, it does come across as a performance and that did not fit the narrative of come as you yeah. are. So there was well, pulpit shaming I, happening I'm not here yet, but this feeds into when I arrive, um, everyone will scrub a toilet. Everyone can hold a microphone. There's no hierarchy. And I feel that also comes from this time period. It does. Yeah. Because guess what I was doing while I was trying to be a worship leader? Guess what ministry? You just said it, Brandy. Guess what Scrubbing ministry toilets. I was running up for? Cleaning. Was, yep. And it became part of my story of like, before I was a worship leader. Now, mind you, okay, so I'm on stage singing. Right. But I'm singing with these like way professional vocalists. Right. So I am a backup singer, but I'm learning. She is teaching me to be a worship leader. So I joined the cleaning team and my story became that before I was ever on the stage, I cleaned toilets. And God told me one day while I was cleaning a toilet that I need to find as much joy scrubbing this toilet as I do when I sing on stage. And I used that anytime somebody would come up against me um, or come up against that narrative of, are you performing? Right. And not that it was like a personal attack on me, but I think that there's that discussion in churches a lot. Like there's a fine line between, we we have some amazing musicians within the the Christian. I mean, like you, anybody who's been to a Christian concert, like really, (laughs) We're going to say, come worship with us, but it's it's like a Taylor Swift concert, right? There's no difference in the showmanship, right? Um, but that would be my story. Well, Melissa cleaned toilets, you know? Oh, I, I have to find as much joy in toilet cleaning as I do in singing. I yeah. do not find as much joy in toilet cleaning as I do in singing. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that was the narrative that was given to all the women. Yeah. Like I had to find as much joy in doing my dishes and folding my laundry as I do in coming to church and serving in the, in the church ministries. Right. And so it is, and I just want to point out, I never once heard a man use that of cleaning a toilet. It was always the man had to fix something at the church or, you know, it was things like that, but a man never had to clean the church. No. And no, their things they had to do were like once or twice a year things that were praised up and down, but the day to, cause the church is basically the same as running a household. So it's great. You go mow the lawn once a week, but somebody has to be doing the dishes daily. But the yeah. group doing the dishes daily, it was a given. But look at that lawn. Yeah. yeah. Well, and a man can find joy and contentment and peace with the Lord in his business work. Yeah. And this is, so shortly after Froggy uh, goes back to work for the church family, um, I also need to be working. You know, we have to recover from, you know, being on disability and, not having jobs and stuff. And so I am offered some data entry work with them. And I go in and they have like, cause they have like, um, you know, inventory and stuff that's got to be inputted and things have to be checked and the descriptions have to be done. So I go in and they have this like enormous amount of data entry. And it's not that I'm like some data entry queen, but I do hyper fixate with ADHD. And so I can sit in front. I don't want to do this as a job. So nobody hire me, but I can sit in front of a computer (laughs) and like 
type in and check and, and it's like a system. And so I have a system and it's like, that like makes my brain go like, yeah, this is awesome. And so I like bust through all this data entry to the point where I work myself out of a job and the owner is like, be careful. Don't go that fast. You're going to work yourself out of a job, right? He's trying to give me helpful advice. Like, yeah, it's great that you can do that, but like, you know, you need a job. And so like, I'm paying you, you might want to make this last longer so that I can keep paying you. But I didn't have to worry because I didn't work myself out of a job. I actually worked myself into a job. And so the, the contrast of who Froggy is and the contrast of who I am in our careers is like night and day. And like, I go in and I do the work and I prove who I am and I have skills and I've done a lot of things. And, um, I pursued a career in the restaurant business from a very young age. And this was during a time when I had gotten burned so bad from a restaurant a few years before meeting, um, froggy that I was never, ever, ever going in the restaurant business again. Cause this, this owner had done me so dirty. Um, and so I'm trying to do anything, but go back to the restaurant business at this point. So I'll do data entry. Um, and then, and then I get promoted. And so I did work myself out of a job, but within a couple of weeks, the owner is like, we want you back. I need so much help with everything. I would hire you as my personal assistant. And so my desk is right next to the owner's desk. And I'm in the office with the owner, with the owner's wife. I'm included in business meetings. Um, like I am, you know, like I'm sending the emails. I'm talking to people. I'm the ambassador of the owner. When he doesn't want to talk to people, they talk to me. And that I'm a little intimate. Yeah. And that led to being in charge of like scheduling the jobs. Um, and then I became the liaison for the insurance work that this company would do. Um, like the, I come in and I take over. That's, that's my skill set, And I don't think that that's a bad thing. It's just who I am. Right. And so my husband is the warehouse guy, but he got allowed to be a salesman because the only way he could go back was he was not going to be the warehouse guy. Okay. So this, this is hilarious. Now, yeah. So he's now a salesman, right? In this business, there's a warehouse guy and all that froggy does the whole time is criticize the warehouse guy. Cause he's not doing it right. And I mean, I, he was right. Like the way that he would run that warehouse was phenomenal but he didn't want to do that job because it didn't have clout. So now right. he's a salesman. He's actually hates the job. There's a lot of the job that's just not him. I mean, he's good at schmoozing people, but there's a lot of it that is, is a struggle for him. Um, and so, but it has clout. So we can be happy and doing something we're good at, but not have clout, or we can have clout and be completely miserable. Right. America. Uh, yeah. And so, I, <laughs> uh, yeah. And so, you know, this stuff is going on. My son, who tore a tendon in his knee that Christmas Eve, gets out of physical therapy. So he had a knee surgery, gets out of physical therapy, and the next day goes to ride a BMX bike and cracks his kneecap in half. Oh my gosh. And so here we go with round two. My son needs a lot of attention. And the reason why these are like important mile markers is because if you didn't give froggy attention, then everything that was attention breaker and would lead to incidents. And so our whole life, so we're working together. So when I said that, like, we're now working together. The tension there is that my desk sits next to boss man. And so I'm the favorite, you know, and it's a problem because then Froggy feels like he's working underneath me because I'm now scheduling his jobs. I'm now, so I have a lot of input into what he does for a living. And now he's, his job with clout being a salesman, well, he's now under his wife and he feels like I have all the clout. And so in his mind, he would rather just switch jobs, I guess. So we're just constantly in this things that cause tension, things that make Froggy mad. If you're not giving Froggy all of the attention, then Froggy is mad. And so then we have incident after incident after incident in my home at this time. 
So even though we're working together, that is alleviating the quantity of incidents. So he can maintain a little better at work because I'm there. Right. Well, right, and have- this isn't just a froggy thing because yeah. this is generational, cultural, and the church. Because I spent many an hour on the phone being at home with women. And the second their husbands walked in the door, it was like we were hiding, shooting up heroin. He's here, I got go. And when you were a really good friend, someone you would know, like if they just hung up on you, it was because their husband came in. Because you better put your full attention on your husband when he walks in that door. Oh my gosh, that like breaks my heart because I know what I went through and you know you brought up a very valid point like I was in isolation. And like that's one of the key reasons why I thought it was important to tell you like the social bumblebee that I am, you know, naturally in my life and I had friend groups and I was doing things I didn't do those things anymore. By this point I was living and breathing and working side by side with my husband. And it was all about him and his life. And I was nothing. And I was in such isolation. And I did not realize that other women experienced the same thing too. And And that's why mom's group was so important to us. Yeah. And even as dysfunctional as it was, we were desperate to keep it. But when you're in a situation like you were, Melissa, like you said, you're alone. Yeah, I looked forward to when the boss's wife came in and she became my gal pal and the boss's daughter. Like we were our mm-hmm. own little trio of girlfriends. So I mean, like, was but I they isolated? they were also experiencing that. Yeah, yeah, no. And, and I mean, like, we were definitely a little bit more open and honest about it within that small group. But I mean, like, we were gal pals and and the owner would hate it. Like, like she, we would go to lunch. <laughs> Like it, he knew it was girl day. <laughs> like when she would come in to do the work that she had to do in the store, it was girl day. And when his daughter was there, he was like, I got to go. Like you girls can just have the whole office. <laughs> so right. Like, so that was my only, but I get it. Like I get it in that mom. Like when Amanda said that, like we needed this so much, um, you know, and that was a break in the isolation that I was, that I was experiencing. And, you know, there's a couple more things. I don't want to drag this out, but these things are like so relevant, like, especially as you girls start pointing out to me that like this was happening culturally. So not every woman was suffering a lot of like necessarily the same abuses that I was, but there's definitely abuses that all women within this culture were experiencing. And, and I don't want to make light of that for anybody because it's, it's not, it's not okay that this woman that you, you know, this is my wife and you're being told in church that you're valued as a wife. Like this is some kind of prize for a man. And you're not even being told that you're being, let me take that back. You're not being told in a way as a wife that you're valued. Your husband is being told that he has this ultimate prize of a wife. My beautiful, talented wife. Yeah, but it's not a reality. And women are being treated like slaves and second-class citizens in what is supposed to be a place where you're, where you're whole and complete and Jesus loves you. Like, none of it makes sense. So we get to the end of, like, 2013. And it's Christmas. And so, like, for Thanksgiving, we travel to spend time with Froggy's family. And then for Christmas that year, we went to my family's house. The issue with this Christmas was, so we went to an amusement park when we were in California. My almost 40 year old husband pouted like a three year old child at the amusement park and went off by himself because things weren't going his way. Okay, dude, you're in a family with a wife and five kids. Like there's gotta be some give, you know, but it was like, you do what I wanna do or I'm gonna throw a big temper tantrum. And so I took the kids, 
the younger ones that were with me and we went off and had a great day. And there's some things like we laugh and I say, when I was told if I would just behave, I wouldn't have these problems. And I woke up and realized one day that it was because I didn't behave that, yeah, I kind of did have some problems. So of course then I'm mouthy and then I'm, but I'm suffering for these things. Like everything I would do, I was then punished for with either something in my house getting broken, being physically intimidated, threatened, um, you know, cabinets being ripped off the wall, holes in the wall, doors being torn off their hinges, um, things like that were going on. I was being punished for the things that I would step out of line for. And so we have so, the, um, go ahead. Was he, was he behaving this way in front of your family? Like while you were in on this no. trip? No, he disengages completely. Like he does not socialize at all because there is no socializing. If you socialize, you're going to show your true colors. So we don't socialize. So he does so not part. And, and like he does not participate. So he comes off very um like better than you. And I don't want anything to do with you. And people you don't realize, like if you go to somewhere, and I mean, even Tom was this way. Like if you would go over to their house for like a barbecue or something like that, he would be like, Hi, welcome, and then go sit on the couch and watch TV. Yeah. That was so he didn't do anything to embarrass himself. Froggy was the yeah. exact same way. He disengaged and just sat there and didn't do it. It was on his phone and wouldn't like, did not engage with anybody because if he did, you would find out his true colors. But when it was, so just he stuff, would rather come off as like a pompous ass. Yes. And, and like, I'm better than you than come off as being abusive. Yeah. Everything okay. he did was in secret when he needed to socialize with you, the limited time that he needed to, he was charming. He was engaging. You know, it's that love bombing Mr. Perfect, but it only lasted for very short amounts of time. But then as soon as you're behind closed doors, so nobody in public would ever be like, wow, I can't believe he's such a scary, crazy, insane, angry person. He's so sweet. Like all the old ladies would come up to Froggy at church and they'd be like, I just love him. You're so lucky. He's like the best. He gives the best hugs. We just love him so much. He's such a sweet boy. You're so lucky. I'm hiding in a closet every other week. Like hiding in a closet. Because my yeah. husband is on an angry rant and he's not mad at anybody or anything. He's yelling at himself. He's yelling. At, God, God only knows what he was mad at. He would go on these like rage, angry rants, breaking things. And I would be so mad because I would be being told behind the scenes that we well, had to have done something. Half of them, I was sleeping. I was literally asleep and I would wake up to this man in a rage yelling and screaming at God knows who or what. Like he would be yelling at me sometimes. You're such a beep, beep, beep. And why did you effing do this? And you're such a, you're this and you're that. I'm a, I, I was, what did I do? I was sleeping, you know? And the, even like the times that I mean, like there's definitely things that I did because some things were just ridiculous to me, like the amusement park. I'm like, you want to be miserable? Go be miserable. You're going to throw a fit in an amusement park? Dude, I've been here, done that with the worst of them. Like, go have fun. And I took the kids and we went around the whole amusement park and all he did was pout. And he pouted the rest of that vacation. And when I look at my pictures from that vacation, I think that he went home. I think he had to be at work um, before I did. For some reason, like, they were like, yeah, go stay as long as you want. But he had to be back into the store and work because he is not. I don't remember him being there after Christmas. And I stayed through the new year. And so I went to a New Year's Eve party with some friends, had the best time. I took the kids. He was there. We did go to a children's museum. He's not in any of the pictures, but I know he was at the children's museum the entire time. All he did was complain. Like, he was like, this was fun. Great. Let's go. I'm like, dude, I just bought all these tickets and we're here to have a good time. And it's like a hands-on discovery museum. 
So there's like things to do. The kids are having a great time. I'm going around with my kids like you do as a parent, right? And all he's doing is like, we got to go. This is dumb. I want to go. How long it's do I have the to the entitlement and it's, yeah. it's the way his mom and dad were. Yeah. And if I didn't cater to it, then my life was made miserable. My kid's life was made miserable. It was always our fault, all of our fault. This is also the time that I ended up having like a huge autoimmune response. I ended up in the emergency room. Um, I could like, I would go through cycles of not being able to eat anything. Like I was convinced that like, like I need to be gluten-free. Like I have celiac. I was at the doctor and all of that. And you know what? So many of those symptoms have gone away. Like I still can't eat a lot of like the wheat and stuff like that. And like, definitely like if I ate a piece of bread, I'm like, ah, oh, that doesn't necessarily agree with me. But I was having like, I was, by the time I left my marriage, I was like an 80 year old woman in my physical body. It was, it became that bad, but this is the time frame where this starts coming up, where I'm mm -hmm. having so many autoimmune responses to things. And so really to like, bring this around and, and sum it all up. Um, you know, 2014 now I'm like promoted at work. So I'm not just now this personal assistant to the owner with my desk next to the owner. Uh, the company brings in a window coverings, you know, like a new product. And so now I'm like the salesperson for that. <laughs> and also the salesmen, the other salesmen are, using me to help them sell. So like I would walk around the showroom and I've now learned enough and I can talk to you about the product and I can make recommendations, but if they've got a hard sale, they would make a loop through the office and I would come out and then I could start talking to the wife. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, I love this you know, product. And oh, and I've got five kids and my kids tear up, you know, our stuff and we've, you know, and this stuff is like water resistant and dent resistant, you know? And so like I could come in and I, and then I could also sound educated because I knew about the products. I mean, I data entry, <laughs> I can tell you all kinds of stuff about them. Oh, um, I can sell distressed hardwood flooring like you would not believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, this is good for me. And like some of the benefits to working together was I had backup. And so when Froggy would, if he would get upset or throw temper tantrums at work or do things, because he did get in trouble a few times for talking to me where a customer said something to the owner and was like, why? Like the things that like, I didn't think it was bad because that's how like it wasn't bad. Because if you knew the level that I was really being talked to, like that was nothing. And then a customer would say something. And so the owner would have to jump in. And so I had a lot of backup when we were, um, at, at the store. Um, but that would also then cause more problems for later on, because that would just be something that would get held onto and I would pay for it later. Um, so, you know, but we went on a vacation over the summer in 2014 to a lake and the night before we were driving to the airport, Froggy and I were staying in a lake house. Um, so like, Tom and Charlotte have a friends who have a lake house and some of the family was staying there and then they had rented a, somebody else's house down the road. And so some of the younger couples were staying there. Like we were all having a good time hanging out on the porch, time to go to bed. And I don't remember what happened, but we lay down to go to sleep. And the next thing I know, Froggy is yelling and screaming and berating and degrading me like the entire lake neighborhood could hear and like I didn't say anything or do anything and I was so embarrassed the next day because everybody everybody knew like that's how he treated his wife and nobody did a damn thing about it or said anything and so we were driving back from the lake to the airport and it was like a long drive because it's on the east coast and you guys have, where you're at you know brandy you have those long roads with the, all the trees on the side right and it's super beautiful and we're driving and i'm staring out the window and i was convinced that i was having this conversation with god about why 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 god 
why is this the situation I'm in? Why is this the way my life is? This isn't how it was supposed to be. I believed you that this was supposed to, this was supposed to like, I was holding on to the things that I really thought of the fairy tale. Like this was supposed to be it. We were supposed to get married and everything was going to be great. And we were going to be in ministry together. And we were going to be doing everything for the Lord. And it was going to be this perfect biblical marriage and the white evangelical Christian fairy tale. And why is my, why is this not like this? And so I'm sitting in this car, looking out the window in the back seat. And I had convinced myself that I was having a conversation with God and that God told me that if Froggy was a good man, it would be a testimony to Froggy. But because God was going to work a miracle in my marriage, it would eventually be a testimony to God. And this is the level of manipulation and just disgustingness that being in an abusive marriage in a church culture, when I say you have to remain and you have to pray and you have to uphold your disgusting husband's behavior as a man of God. It is acceptable because God is going to use this for his glory someday. And yeah. I think it is a... We're slapping something on it because we can't talk about mental health. We can't talk about what's really going on. We can't hold men accountable. Heaven forbid the women start talking. And so we need to have a reason why all of this is okay. And that reason is that we don't know the things of God. And it will all work out for his glory someday. So I just need to sit down and shut up and take my lumps and deal with it. And it's fine that I'm sad for a moment. It's fine that I'm grieving for a moment. It's fine that I'm upset for a moment, but then I need to get over it, move on. We keep no record of wrongs. And I am going to trust that God will use this for good someday. And it's almost like we gaslight ourselves with those verses. Oh, yeah. To... I put myself into thinking that I was walking with God and I had this close relationship because every mm -hmm. Sunday to get up on stage, I had to be in a state of forgiveness and be right with God, you know, yeah. which just, and I was swepping all of my husband's indiscretions under the carpet and, you know, and our, our protocol at home, like I said, I would bring my kids into this, you know, you never knew what it was going to be that was going to set him off. Like life would happen and go on. Like he would not participate, not have an opinion, but, and would just sit there and play on his phone outside on the front porch, would just sit for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and not participate. And I would be running everything. And then as soon as he wanted an opinion, we would have to bow to his opinion, but he had no idea what was going on or what I just like, it was, it was like bizarre. And then this would turn into these fits of rage and everything. And so the kids had a protocol of like, you go to the basement. Like as soon as his voice would race, they would all just like little rats <laughs> scatter down to the basement. And that was our way of protecting them from what was going on. I know there's a lot of people out there that will be like, but did he hit you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you weren't abused. You don't have a black eye. Um, when you are threatened continually by somebody that you believe can and will kill you if, um, if they wanted to, and he was using like his past experiences, he was glorifying those to intimidate me. So whenever he needed to intimidate me, he would say things like, um, he would tell me stories about how like he put a baseball bat through his high school girlfriend's windshield and, um, you know, different situations where he was very honest about the abuse that he, um, he had was driving with another girlfriend in a car and pulled the emergency brake and spun the car out, um, to scare her and threaten her. Like he told me this story. Um, he ran somebody else's car into a tree when they made him mad. 
these stories would be used to intimidate and threaten me so that I knew that if I stepped out of line, my fate would be that or worse. And it almost is like you see in movies where somebody's like, well, if you're going to leave me, then you're going to die. If you leave me, I'm going to kill your kids. Um, if you leave me, like something so bad is going to happen to you. I have a question. Um, yeah. Did, you said like if a customer uh, saw something, then like someone might say something, whatever. Did anyone in the church ever say, hey, he shouldn't be saying that to you. Hey, that shouldn't be happening. Nope. Right. No. Anybody in the church, the story was always, I need to forgive. I need to pray. Um, I've gone back through like notebooks and I've got like this whole, like all of these little prayer journals of things like that was my job. My job was to forgive. My job was to pray. My job was to remain. My job was to act better. So he didn't have to act that way. Um, because the issues that occur within come as you are as a high control body of Christ organization, um, extend into the family. There's a very high control family organization. And throughout this time, I was groomed uh, to participate within the family dynamic the way that I was supposed to participate within the family dynamic. And um, I will say this, okay? Like Charlotte was really, really good at doing this family dynamic. And Yes, a lot of it was for toxic reasons. And yes, a lot of it ended up in, in toxic and trauma type things. But if I have to take the silver lining, because you, you can't go through life holding on to like all of these. This is a lot of negative stuff at some point. I am grateful for the things that I did learn about family because it has shaped and developed my family and taught me the things that there are important things with family that I want in my life that I did gain, you know, from being a part of this family, even to the point where I think I stayed in my marriage a lot longer than I should have, because I didn't want to lose my family that I had because the family dynamic, there was a lot of reward and benefit to it. And, and there were a lot of things that were good. Um, it is unfortunate that a lot of it was used to manipulate and in a, a high control toxic way. Burning Butterflies is a listener-supported podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by our amazing supporters on Patreon. Follow the link in our show notes to learn how you can become a Patreon supporter too. Supporters get exclusive access to bonus content each month, including outtakes, cut content, and supporter-only episodes. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating on your listening platform. Burning Butterflies is a production of Asha Media. Thank you for listening.